thanks for being faithful and just being um, flexible and open. And we don't have a script for this at all. We just um, wanted to get people down here out, out in an open space and worship the Lord. And God, thank goodness it's cooling off. Somewhat cooling off, right? And now it's going to get hot because Pastor Alan DiDio from Encounter Christ Church, he's bringing the heat tonight, right? He's bringing the heat tonight. How many of you, how many of you um, were at any part of Saturate NC, the revival down at Locust? Just look around, Alan. Man, thanks for your faithfulness, really, because I know, because we talked, um, and a <laughs> little trade secret here. A lot of people think pastors have it all figured out. And usually we're just like, I think God said this. <laughs> and so you jump on that. And he just felt like God said that was what they were supposed to do. And I was at that thing every night. And it was true. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. So thank you for doing that. We were honored to be just a small part of that. Um, and so that's just how, just how God's moving in this area. I just want you to know that we're not bringing somebody up here tonight hoping it'll be good. Like we just know, we know that God's put something in you. You've had a burden for revival for the longest time, more than like an event of revival, but an experience, a moment, a movement of revival. And so he's invested spiritually, personally in God moving in our county. And so when something like that happens and somebody that carries that comes and shares something with you, we don't do the golf clap thing, right? Oh, it's so good to have you here, Pastor Allen. How do we welcome people like that to our platform, y'all? Come on, get up. Give them a welcome. Would you just remain standing with me? Everybody stand all across this place. Lift your hands and just begin to pray for a minute. I sense something in my spirit. I got a report before I came in here about a, a, a persecution uh, increase that was taking place in Pakistan right now. Could you begin to pray right now? Can we push past the formalities just for a moment? And let's, let's lift our voices right now. Lift those hands, lift those voices, and just begin to pray. You don't even need to know what to pray, but just begin to pray with your spirit, with your understanding. But let's take a minute right now to enter into a little bit of warfare, just for a minute, just for a minute. Yeah, come on, come on. Oh, I feel something different in here now. Something's about, we're about to break through into another level here in a minute. Come on, press in just for a minute. Press in just for a minute. Not just about persecution that's happening around the world, but what about what's happening here in the United States of America? How about in the name of Jesus, we come against every attack of the enemy to hinder the declaration of the word of the Lord right now in the name that is above every name. We command every demon spirit to go in the name of Jesus. Every oppressive, tormenting, depressing, deceiving spirit, go in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's till up the fallow ground for a minute. I know you don't, you don't need a guitar and drums to pray. Come on, let's till up the fallow ground for a minute. Lord, we come to you today like Isaiah, and we say, rend the heavens. Rend the heavens and come down. Come on, in your own way, in your own way, rend the heavens and come down. What a dangerous prayer. Rend the heavens. Lord, we recognize that when the cry of sin is greater than the cry of intercession, there can never be revival. We lift our voices in this place. We lift up the cry of intercession, and we lift it up greater than the cry of sin of this generation. And we pray, God, for a breakthrough in the name of Jesus, a breakthrough in this generation. They will not be blinded. They will not be bound by the enemy. They will be set free and revived by the power of your word. Rend the heavens, rend the heavens, rend the heavens, 
over the gathering, rend the heavens, rend the heavens, rend the heavens, ah. rend the heavens. Rend the heavens, rend the heavens. I dare you, lift your voice, make your neighbor nervous. Rend the heavens, rend the heavens. Rend the heavens, rend the heavens, rend the heavens. Rend the heavens. That's just King James. It means tear up the heavens. Tear it up. The heavens are for signs and for seasons. It's dangerous when you pray, rend the heavens. You say, God, tear up the natural order. Tear up the natural order of things, God. Mess up my life. I don't care if you mess it up. If it means you come, rend the heavens. Over Albemarle, tear up the heavens. Come on, we're going to take two more minutes to pray. I know sometimes we're used to other people doing it for us, but I want you to pray. I want you to pray. So I, I, spent, I spent seven years in a prayer center before I ever preached a word. I prayed. I prayed every day, hours every day before I ever preached, before I ever stood on a platform. I prefer this over all things. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Somebody needs to grab a hold of the horns of the altar and say, God, not this generation. No, not in the name of Jesus. Somebody needs to say, you know what? Tonight, I don't care what anybody else does, I am going to allow God to invade this space. I am going to increase the borders of his habitation. I don't, I don't care what anybody else does, but in the name of Jesus, I'm going to call God down on Albemarle, North Carolina. Well, if he inhabits the praises of his people, I dare you to take 60 seconds and praise him. Come on, that's about 15 seconds. You got 45 more. Come on. Praise him for what he's done, for what he's doing. For what he's about to do, you got 30 more seconds. Praise him. Let the devil know you will not be silent. Praise him. Ten more seconds. Now give him two or three more hallelujahs while you're seated. You be seated. You don't have to stop praising him when you're seated either. It's just a suggestion. Such an honor to be here. Hallelujah. Now the Bible says let all things be done decent and in order. So let me, let me lay some things out. Shouting is in order. Clapping is in order. Receiving your healing, it's in order. Receiving a fresh endowment of the Holy Spirit, pressing through the crowd, it's in order. Let your neighbors say, make sure everything's in order. Let me tell you what's not in order. Passivity is not in order. That's rebellion. Timidity is not in order. A timid faith will be intimidated. Say, that's not in order. But a hallelujah and a luya, that's in order. Hmm. 
I was praying, such an honor to be here, Pastor Paul, thank you, to the gathering. Let's thank God for the gathering, for putting this together. Fifty percent of regular church attenders say that they have not experienced the presence of God in the last year, if not in their entire lives. 50% of regular church attenders say they have not experienced the presence of God in the last year or if in their entire lives. And as I was praying about this and as I was coming into this this evening, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, for many that have gathered here this night, they are at a threshold moment. This church, the gathering, is at a threshold moment. They are about to cross over into a new season. It is not for everyone, but it is for the burning ones. The same study said that fewer than one in ten born-again Christians have a biblical worldview that they allow to impact their decisions and their behavior. I'm not talking to those nine out of the ten who have allowed this to become a social club or some way to smooth over their religious consciences. I'm talking to the one out of ten. There is a remnant in here tonight who say, I'm not here to please any man. I am here to seek after God. I'm talking to that one. Somebody tonight is about to get a breakthrough. You're at a crossover moment. I have a message for you. There was once a wall between you and a fresh endowment of the Holy Ghost. This is for somebody. I don't know who this is that's going to be here tonight, but I know there's one person this is for. The wall that was between you and a fresh endowment of the Holy Ghost has been removed. And now there is a thin tissue barrier, and if you will reach out, you will break through. Hallelujah. Saturate taught me something. This last year has taught me something. And if you pray with your spirit, pray with your understanding, if you pray just under your breath as we, as we take a moment here, would you just, just pray? The intercessors who know what I'm talking about, just pray because we're going to stir something up here in a minute and release something that I think is going to change somebody's life. More than a year ago, I don't know how long ago it was, the Spirit of God moved us to begin interviewing prophetic voices in the body of Christ. It was a tremendous step of faith, and we had no idea that anyone would agree to interview us. But shockingly enough, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, people began to reach out, and we began to speak with different individuals. And it came to a point where even the Spirit of God in prayer would speak to me a name of someone that I did not know. I knew they were in ministry, but I don't know them. You know what I mean? I don't know their doctrine. I don't know their, how, how sound they are theologically. I don't know that. And it was a step of faith. The Spirit of God I want, said, I want you to talk to them. And that began a journey with me of, of, of venturing out into different camps. And you may not be aware of this, but there are different camps in the body of Christ. And very rarely do they merge. Very rarely do they meet. In fact, in today's world, even with social media, it's not helping us reach more people. It's helping us to stay confined in our own little echo chamber where we have the same people with the same way of thinking as we have saying the same thing back to us over and over and over and over again. So rarely do we venture out. And so if you're a traditional Pentecostal, you don't really, you don't really go over into the, the, the prophetic area, the prophetic camp of the mood of God. Or if you're more traditional, you don't really go into 
the Pentecostal camp, and, and then, there's, then there's among the Pentecostals and the Charismatics, there's their own divisions that have nothing to do with doctrine, but more to do with style, and we, we get nervous when somebody's going to come in, and they, they're going to do a style that might be different from ours, and we're, we're concerned about the, the doctrine, you know. We, we know they've got the central tenets of the faith, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the core doctrines. I'm talking about the ancillary issues, and we're concerned they're going to mess things up, and we have to clean things up, and so we defied ourselves from one another. We have been separated from our parts. And it breeds more radicalism. It breeds more extremism because I don't have a counter anymore to challenge me. Now I'm just in this echo chamber and we just get louder and louder as we talk to each other. And I said, God, concerning one particular place, one particular camp, I don't want to associate with them because they're not sound doctrinally. Yeah, they've, they've got a hold of a, a passionate move of the Holy Ghost, but th- there's, there's room for error there, and I don't want to introduce that into my section, my camp. And God said to me, well, if you're so concerned about doctrine, don't I need you over there with them? What happens when everybody who's concerned about doctrine leaves here and goes over here? And only those who are concerned about the moving of the Holy Ghost leave here and go over here. Then we get, we get radical emotionalism, dead formalism. And, and you understand when we're talking about the moving of the Holy Ghost, we're talking about word and spirit coming together. Two really entirely different things if you, if, you, if you think about it, even emotionally and personally. You, you like hanging around people who like talking about the things you like talking about. It's uncomfortable getting around people from a different camp. But I took a step of faith. And the glory, the unmitigated joy and peace that gets released into your life when you allow God to bring His body to you. No longer separated, no longer disjointed like the bones in the valley in Ezekiel 37 coming together. One new man. I'm telling you this because I believe God's about to make you step out of your comfort zone. I believe that God is going to bring unlikely allies to your side. Right now in the United States of America, we have no room for division in the body. We need each other. More than I need to agree with you on the gifts of the Holy Ghost. More than I need to agree with you on your eschatology. More than I need to agree with you on how you worship, how you praise. More than I need to agree with you on your preaching style. We are in a desperate moment in America, and we have no more room for a divided church. God is bringing the camps together. It's happening now. It is a prophetic end-time move. God is bringing people from the north, south, east, and west, from every faction and form of the body of Christ. We're coming together, and it's uncomfortable. It makes me nervous. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. How many of you nervous? No, don't, don't look at the person next to you. I know you're talking about that. I'm telling that to you because we are about to enter into a battle. Would you go, to, I don't know if you have your Bible. If you have your Bible, you can go to the book of Ephesians. That's where we're going to be here in a moment, here in a moment. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. As I stand here tonight and look at what the Lord is doing in the gathering and through the gathering, I know the price that's being paid for even being here tonight. I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm not even talking about the price to put this event on. I'm talking about the decades of pressing into the kingdom, of praying, of standing in faith. There is a cost in Pentecost that few are willing to pay. And I can't tell you that most, or I can tell you that most can't get beyond their own pride. 
Most in the body of Christ can't get beyond their own need for control, their own desire for vain glory. Most, and I want you to get this in your spirit, don't have the humility to survive their own mistakes. Boy, that statement, that statement packs a punch. Most don't have the humility to survive their own mistakes. You see, when you're sensitive, and I'm not talking about people who have become so callous to the Holy Spirit. You know, people that, you know, they get away with stuff, and you wonder, how in the world do they not hear the Holy Ghost telling them, shut up? How many of you know what I'm talking about? How do they get away? I'm not talking about people who are just so callous, they can't sense or feel the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about people who are sensitive to to the wooing of the Holy Spirit, and your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit can be manipulated as a weapon of the enemy against you. Because when you fail, you feel the failure deeply. Because you realize you haven't just failed yourself, you haven't just failed man, but you realize you have offended the very nature of God. You have offended the very person of your Savior. And it, and it reaches you to your core And very few have the humility to allow the Lord to heal that failure. I'm talking to somebody tonight. The devil convinces you of your own unworthiness and uses your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to accomplish it. Because you feel the conviction. You sense it. You know it. And then he begins to use it to condemn you instead of convict you. Do you know the difference between condemnation and conviction? Conviction is to your, is to your spirit what pain is to your body. Without conviction, you wouldn't know you had offended God. Without pain, you wouldn't know you could cut your foot on a broken piece of glass and bleed to death and not even know it. Because pain is not your enemy. It is the indicator that one exists. Conviction is not the enemy. Don't get mad at your preacher for preaching convicting messages. Conviction is not the enemy. It is just the indicator that one exists. Condemnation is your enemy. What is, how do I know the difference between conviction and condemnation? When you repent, conviction leaves. Whew. Everybody say, move, Holy Ghost. This fan is nice. It's messing up my notes. No, no, it's wonderful. It's glorious. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Someone once said, a more accurate description of the church can be found in the first four words of this verse. For we wrestle not. We were were smuggling Bibles into a Muslim nation, a place where if you were found doing such a thing, it could be Torture, life in prison, death, because you're dealing with Sharia law. I was smuggling Bibles into the nation because when I got to a village, I saw something that blew my mind. There was one village that had one Bible, but they had tore it to pieces. Because while one was reading the Gospel of Mark, another one over here in this hut was reading the book of Deuteronomy. And while they were reading the book of Deuteronomy, another over there was reading the Gospel of Luke. And they cherished it. And they passed it around. And I remember when we brought Bibles into that village and we handed people their very own Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, the joy that filled their souls. And God said, when you get back to America, I want you to make sure that you inspire men and women to love my word, to fight. You see, what they had done is they had fought for that word. They had fought to find a Bible. They had fought to cherish it and to care for it. And God rewarded it by bringing tons of Bibles to their village so that everybody could have one. I believe it's time for the body of Christ once again to fight for the word of God. Not just fight with it. We've got to fight 
for the word of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they can't keep you from carrying these weapons into your school. They don't show up on a metal detector. The weapons that you have can accomplish great things. COVID can't stop them. The United States government can't stop them. The censors can't stop them. In fact, the more you afflict us, the more we grow and the more we multiply. But for many, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Many in the church wrestle not. There's a difference between playing catch in your backyard and and the two-minute warning of the Super Bowl. What's the difference? There's something on the line at the Super Bowl and someone's trying to intercept the pass. I'm going to give you two great revelations of prayer very quickly, two great revelations of prayer that I've learned in more than two decades of study of the subject. Number one, God is listening. If you really believe God was listening, how would you pray? What would you pray? When would you pray? There was a small town in North Carolina back in the... uh, early 1900s that had historically been dry, no alcohol served in that town. And the tavern owner or business owner wanted to build a tavern. And back then, when holiness was actually a thing, the church got upset. Now the church would partner with them, but we'll talk about that some other time. The church got upset and had an all-night prayer meeting, pray that God would stop the tavern from being built. During their prayer meeting, lightning struck the tavern and it burned to the ground. The tavern owner sued the church, saying their prayers were responsible. The church, of course, hired of course hired a defense attorney to say we didn't have anything to do with it. The presiding judge over the case said, regardless of how this case works out, one thing is perfectly clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer, but the church does not. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, if we really believed in prayer, how much would we pray? How often would we pray? How hard would we pray? What would we allow to come out of our mouths? We wouldn't sit passively by. Isn't it interesting as we enter into a decade where God is calling the church to rise up and speak loud, to lift up their voice like a trumpet, all of a sudden the world says, put a mask on your face. We don't want to hear you. We don't want to see. I'm not talking about masks. You want to wear masks? That's fine. I'm talking prophetically. The enemy is trying to silence your mouth. If we really believe that prayer worked, why would we go to church? Would we go in order to sit passively and hear some nice lesson? Or would we go because we believe that when we gather together where two or three are gathered in that place, that he would be there in the midst of us and that when we would decree some things, they would be established and we would be able to move some things in the Spirit. Do you realize why you're here tonight? You're not here just to receive something. You're here to move something in the Spirit. To shift things in the atmosphere. But the problem is is that most Christians act as though God is not listening. We are praying for the benefit of the people standing around us. We want to sound like we know what we're doing, or at least that we're not an idiot when it comes to prayer. First revelation, God is listening. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things that you did not even know was possible. Call unto me, and I will. I don't know where we got a God that doesn't hear and answer prayer. I don't know where this theology came from, but I do know what my Bible says. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. I do know that Matthew 18 says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I do know that this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. My God answers prayer. Elijah on Mount Carmel called, fire down from heaven. How do we distinguish between the real God and every other false God? Our God answers. And he answers by fire. Revelation number one, God hears when you pray. What is it? Number one revelation, what is it? 
Number two revelation, here it is. The devil's listening when you pray. This is one of the biggest revelations that you can receive because most believers passively pray and carelessly quote scriptures they really don't even mean. All the while the enemy is intercepting every prayer that comes out of their mouth. You have a spiritual foe. You want revival? You want healing? You want deliverance? Do you want to see God move in the schools in Stanley County? Do you think the devil's going to sit back and allow that to happen? The devil's listening when you pray. Good. Let him listen. He's listening when you pray. Do you remember Daniel? He began to pray, and after 21 days, the angel showed up, and Daniel said, where have you been? You ever felt that way before? I mean, this was urgent. Where have you been? And the angel said, the moment you prayed, the answer was released, the moment, immediately. In fact, I believe if you look in the Hebrew, it's just before it came out of your mouth, God sent me. Just like that. Well, why did it take 21 days? The prince of Persia withstood me. There was a warfare going on. Now, this will wreck your theology. Daniel prayed. God answered, and he still didn't have it. What we do is we pray, we don't see it, so we rewrite our theology. Well, it must not have been his will. What if Daniel began to write a lesson on prayer on the 20th day? Because sometimes God does, and sometimes he doesn't. After 21 days, there was a breakthrough. 21 days, the angel broke through with the answer. Listen to me. Listen to me, brother and sister, every single one of you. I know you've been crying out to God. I know you've been praying for some things. You've been believing for some things. You've been fasting for some things. And I came here tonight to tell you the answer is already on the way. It's already on the way. But there's a war going on. And believers are passively sitting by and they're throwing their prayers up in the air and they're hoping and praying and wishing and praying and hoping and praying and wishing and praying without any thought of the enemy. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Say, I have weapons. You know, there's a prophecy concerning the millennium when Jesus returns, and the Bible says that we will beat our swords into plowshares. But what's happened in the body of Christ is we're so divorced from any anointing to understand the times and the seasons. We went ahead and beat our swords into plowshares a long time ago. And God's saying, I need you to beat your plowshares back into swords. We have taken the sword, we have taken the weapons and the implements of God's war, and that we have turned them into tools of maintenance to grow our ministries, to take care of our families. And God is saying, I want you to take what you're using for maintenance, and I want you to turn it into an offensive weapon to go and take the city. And when you've taken the city, I want you to set it on fire according to the commandment of the Lord. Are you still praying with me? Are you still believing God with me? Are you still standing in faith with me? The enemy is listening. And the body of Christ has got to get a hold of that. If, if there's one thing that's important in combat, it's situational awareness. More important than the weapon you carry is your, the awareness that you carry. It doesn't matter your weapon. In fact, if you didn't have a weapon at all, someone who is situationally aware can take out any adversary. That's how powerful situational awareness is. And we're just coming through 9-11. I'm just sharing from my spirit right now. We're just, we're just coming from, from inaugurating and, 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 and remembering what took place 20 years ago, or at least looking back and seeing what we've forgotten over the last 20 years of the lesson that we were supposed to have learned. When planes collided with the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania, the question was, how was this possible? How could this have happened? 
Do you remember? I don't know. Some of you weren't alive back then, but I remember the committee meetings and the Senate hearings and the and the and the reports that were done. And when all was said and done, here was a summary of what we learned. They were at war with us, but we were not at war with them. That was the lesson that we learned. How is it possible that a ragtag group of people from a backwater somewhere, from a desert somewhere, could attack the greatest superpower on the earth because they were at war with us, we were not at war with them? Warfare awareness changes everything. It changes even the smallest things that you do. If you can get this to shift in your thinking and begin to imagine every moment of every day, the enemy is trying to stop this. Not to be fearful. I'm not talking to you about seeing a devil in every doorknob. I'm just saying being aware because it changes your posture. Even if you look at something as simple as walking into a grocery store, you do it without even thinking. You're scrolling through the notifications on Facebook and you're walking in not think, thinking about even the cars that are coming at you. Something you do often, you know what you're doing. What would happen if you got a report that that week there had been 10 armed robberies in that parking lot? What would you do? Well, you probably wouldn't go. But what if you had to go because there was a sale on ice cream and the fast was ending and you got to get your ice cream? There have been 10 armed robberies. I don't care. Get out of my way. But you're not going to be scrolling through your phone, are you? You're not going to be casually walking in. Your, your head is going to be on a swivel. You're going to be looking around. You're going to have your keys protruding from your fist just in case. Or maybe you might have, you know what I'm talking about. Might just have your hand. What happens when you get warfare awareness in the body of Christ? How you pray over your food changes. How you pray for your pastor changes. How you pray for your Sunday morning church service, and when you walk in, you recognize that the enemy is doing everything he can to stop from allowing the gathering to accomplish what God has called it to accomplish. And so before I even walk through the doors, I'm going to begin to bind and loose. I'm going to be, begin to pray. I'm going to begin to enter in and allow God to hear my voice and allow the devil to hear my voice. And the Bible says that praise stills the avenger. So I'm going to praise my God in the middle even of my mess and allow the enemy to be paralyzed so that the word of God can be preached without interference and without hindrance. You have a part to play on the 14th row on a Sunday morning church service, and nobody knows your name. When you walk in, your anointing adds to the atmosphere. Your prayers make a difference. Your warfare is needed. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm sorry, I thought it was you. <laughs> it's not against flesh and blood principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness. It says in one verse, I believe four times, against, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against, 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 against. Why? He didn't need to do that. He's saying something. That word against has to do with proximity. It's the same words that used in John chapter 1 and verse 1 when the Bible says the word was with God. The word that's used to describe the proximity of the word to God, this close, it's used to describe how close you are to principalities and powers every moment of every day. Everybody say, God is listening. Say, the devil is listening. And I could care less. He's bound in Jesus' name. Hmm. Desire is important. Desiring God to move in your life, desiring God to move in your church, it's important, but it's not all important. Some things have to be contended for. Some things have to be fought for. Some things require a battle. And when you begin to enter into warfare, you'll, you'll recognize that the battle is not always without. Sometimes it's within. And when you begin to engage in real spiritual warfare, and that's what I'm contending for here tonight, I'm contending for an impartation of a fighting spirit on the inside of you. That when you leave here over after these four days of revival, you'll fight to contend to keep that which God has given you and to advance it in your family and in the community. That's what I'm contending for tonight, a fighting spirit to get on the inside of you. 
you recognize that in this battle, the first casualty has to be you. You have to be the first casualty. You have to put your flesh up on that cross and say, I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be hurt. I'm not going to be me-centered. I'm not going to allow the failures of my past to hinder what I'm pursuing in my present. I am going to fight for the kingdom. We need to rend our hearts, not our garments. And when we rend our hearts, God will rend the heavens. I want you to stand up on your feet for a minute. I've got more to share, but I want, I want to do something right now. What no one seems to realize, when you're talking about the armor of God, and that's what I was going to preach on tonight, but we're not getting to the armor of God. When you talk about the armor of God, we think we put it on to be strong. You have to be strong to put it on. When you look at Roman armor, and you see how heavy it is, they're, cu- they're carrying more than 110 pounds. You have to be strong to put it on. So when we're talking about putting on the armor of God, there has to be an endowment of power to put it on. And that's why Jesus said, now wait, boys, I know you've received everything from me. You've been with me three years. You've heard my teaching. You've got it down. But before you go, I need you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He had already breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. After breathing on them, after telling them to receive the Spirit, he says, you're not ready. Because the spirit that's in you needs to get on you. And when it gets on you, it's going to empower you to put the armor on and to be my witnesses. You know what the translation of witness is? Martyr. You have to be the first casualty. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is what empowers you to put on the armor. And there's a great discussion about the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you can have that some other time with somebody else who's interested. You know what the real evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? Holiness. A man with an unclean spirit does unclean things. A man with an evil spirit does evil things. A man with the Holy Ghost does holy things. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness is power. You see, we seek God. So often we ask God for miracles, and here's what I want you to get. Don't ever forget this. When you ask God for a miracle, more often than not, he'll give you an instruction. I remember one time I was praying about going on on television, and I was praying about doing a television program, and I asked the Lord about it, and he said, have a yard sale. I said, what? I I don't like yard sales. I'm not doing a yard sale. I want to do television. Have a a yard sale. So we carried our junk out in the driveway and had a yard sale. And I was sharing some stuff with people and telling people about stuff. And a gentleman came up to me and said, are you Alan DiDio? I said, yes. He said, I've been listening to you on the radio, and I've been looking for you. And when I heard your voice, I just recognized that it was you. I've been wanting to put you on television. (laughs) What? Have a yard sale. Best said yard sale ever. When you ask God for a miracle, we were praying for our son. Our son, our son, the first year and a half, two years of his life, he was sick every other week. Just one, one infection after another. And when you've got a crying toddler, you, how many of you know this ain't happy? This is not a happy time. And we're not talking about for a day or for a week. We're talking about for like a year and a half. And the doctors wanted to do surgery, and I just could not wrap my brain around allowing them to cut my boy. Not that, it's anything wrong, not that there's anything wrong with that. But I felt like God had something for us. So we prayed for healing, and God gave us an instruction. He said, sow a seed. So we went to the church. We laid a seed on the altar. What's your name? Chandra, could you two come here for a second? 
Could some people who know these folks and know how to pray come stand behind them for a second? Everyone stretch your hands toward them right now and begin to pray. Stretch your hands toward them right now and begin to pray. I don't know, just as I'm talking about family breakthrough, God says, I don't hear anybody praying. Come on, you got to contend. you got to contend. you got to tell the devil, loose their family and let them go in the name of Jesus. You have to, don't expect God to do it for you. He's given you the authority. One of the most horrific places you could ever find yourself in is when you're expecting God to do something for you, he's empowered you to do yourself. Come on, stretch your hands toward them and begin to pray as if your prayer was the only thing that was going to turn this situation around. I see in the Spirit a great sacrifice on the altar. I see the two of you laying a sacrifice. I'm not talking about what you need to do. I'm talking about something you've already done. And the Lord says you have sacrificed greatly. And I have seen your sacrifice. You did it for another reason, for my kingdom. You sacrificed for my kingdom. But God says your sacrifice, like a sweet-smelling Savior, is rising up before his throne. And he is now, it's like a memorial. And he's going to remember your family now. God is remembering your family. And he is releasing, in the name of Jesus, a a fresh door of opportunity on your family. Now, 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 now. Now, 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 now. Who? Now, God, now, now, now. Something's breaking over their family, ladies and gentlemen. Something's breaking over their family. Just, come on, come on, come on. Pray, 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 pray. It's already done. It's already done. You have sacrificed greatly for the kingdom, and now your sacrifice has become a memorial before God, and he is remembering your family. Ah! Come on, there's somebody who believes their prayer moves mountains. I need to hear you. I need to hear you. There's a fresh endowment of power that's coming. That's coming. Oh, I I feel the Holy Ghost moving. I can almost see him moving among these chairs right now. Moving among these chairs right now. Power. Power. A fresh endowment of power. I'm not talking about people who are casually interested in the Holy Spirit or the strength He can give them. I'm talking to somebody who says, listen, I can't move further. I can't go one more step if I don't get an endowment of power. I need the strength of the Spirit of God to do what He's called me to do. I don't want to go another day. I'm hungry for the presence of God. I want a fresh baptism. There's some of you that have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you want it. Some of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you want a fresh Fresh endowment. You've become stale. You want more. You need God to move in your life. If that's you, I wouldn't wait for an altar call. I would begin to move down here right now in the name of Jesus. You want a fresh move of the Holy Ghost in your life. Come on. Come on. Yeah, pray, church. Pray. Intercessors, come down here and stand behind them. Give, come, come, get as close to the stage as you can. Get as close to the stage as you can and begin to pray. Just lift your hands and begin to ask the Lord. Begin to ask the Lord. Come on, come down here. Come down here. Come in close. We've got to make room. Come in close. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I didn't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. Someone simply said, I I was newly saved. I was an atheist, and I'd just been saved. And somebody said, do you want power to serve God? Come down to the altar. I said, yep. Sign me up. And I went down to the altar, and I was just thanking him in faith, you know, just thank, thank you for giving me power. And that thank you turned into just some, it turned into a language I didn't understand. 
And I was like, what is going on? What is happening? And I didn't know that the Bible says that the Spirit of God will make intercession through you with groanings that cannot be uttered. I believe God is about to release some groanings in this place, some warfare prayers. You haven't known how to pray for your family. You haven't known how to pray for your job. You haven't known how to pray for your city or your church. But God is about to release a fresh impartation of glory, of glory, of glory, of glory. Who has never received who has never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit but you want it tonight? Never. You that's you? Come stand right here. Come stand right here. That's you? Stay right there. Stay right there. Blessed be God forever. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Get ready. Now listen. This is not about emotion. This is about Jesus moving in the heart of someone who's hungry for more of him. God's about to release some prayer languages in here. But here's what I need you to hear. Jesus is the baptizer. That's why it makes me so nervous. There ain't nothing I can do. He is the one. And he said, call unto me, and I will answer thee. If you ask me for bread, I won't give you a stone. You don't have to worry about getting the wrong thing. But in the Bible, throughout the book of Acts, the Bible says that the apostles would lay their hands. We serve a gracious God that when you can't hear him, He'll send a preacher along who will speak to you in a, in, a, in a tone that you can hear. Or if you can't reach him, Paul brought handkerchiefs and aprons. And when you can't touch God, he'll allow a minister to lay hands on you, and he'll touch you through them. And they would lay hands on them. It's almost like an ordination. It's almost like a commission that God imparts something and deposits something on the inside of you. And those of you that came down here to the altar, listen, I'm just, me and Pastor Paul, we're just vessels, but the moment we lay hands on you tonight, I feel it. I feel it. The moment we lay hands on you tonight, whether you've never prayed in the Holy Ghost or whether you just want more, something different is going to happen on the inside of you. Amen. Woo! And you're going to feel it bubbling up in you. It's okay to let it out. We're not having you lead prayer up here. If that were the case, we need an interpreter. No, no, no. This is just you and God. Something's going to come up out of you. Well, how do I know it's not gibberish? Faith. Faith. Woo. But here's the thing. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is for somebody. This is for somebody. You can't speak two languages at the same time. Nor can you drink with your mouth closed. So the moment we lay hands on you, I want you to open your mouth. Ah. And the moment you do and you allow the Spirit of God to speak through you, something's going to shift over your house, over your family. It's, bre it's already starting to break right now. Right now, honey, it's already starting to break. Glory to God. The moment, say this, the moment hands get laid on me. Come on, say it out loud. Say, the moment hands get laid on me, I receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I will speak the perfect prayer. Now just begin to thank him that that's what's going to happen. And begin to think, and this is going to happen. And the moment I lay hands on you, are you ready? What's her name? Melissa, Melissa are you ready? <laughs> 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 
Stretch your hands toward Melissa now. Lift your hands, lift your hands. If you're here to receive, lift those hands, lift those hands. Lift those hands, lift those hands. Just begin to pray, just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. You see, when you receive this power, it's power to be a witness. And so it's power to speak. It's power to open your mouth. And some of you need a fresh endowment of it Not for yourself, but for your church. God's about to empower you for greater things. For greater things. Hallelujah. Right there, right there. Gentlemen, right there. Right there. Aaron. Aaron, come here. Come here. Lift your hands, Aaron. Father, make him a pillar in the house of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, oh, yeah, yeah, the Lord said, I'm going to put my hand on him now, 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 now. There it is. There it is. Come on, I need everybody in this building to pray. Band, if you can come up here, begin. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, I need some folks who can flow with me in the Holy Ghost for a minute. Somebody's hungry to break through. They're hungry for more of God, and they don't want to leave here until they get it. They want God to move in their lives. They want God to move in their hearts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pastor Paul, can you come with me? Stretch your hands this way. Who's this young woman right here? With this beautiful baby. Tasha. Tasha? Hallelujah. 
Stretch your hands toward Tasha. Such a hunger for the things of God. The moment I saw you last night, the Lord said, I want you to lay hands on her for an endowment of power. Ah. You've reached a plateau, but God's about to break you through. Spiritually, you're coming up to another level. And when you break through this plateau, there have been people who haven't been able to come with you, but some of them are going to be able to come with you that you've been praying for. And so the moment I lay hands on you, there's a fresh endowment of power. If you can lift at least one hand, I know you're holding on to that baby. <laughs> holding on to that baby. Oh, God. Oh, God. Stretch your hands toward her. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. What you don't realize is a lot of time you go to pr people that have been struggling with praying in the Holy Ghost, you go to pray, and what happens is instead of praying in the Holy Ghost, you say hallelujah or something, and then tears come out. And you just redirected it to your eyes. You just need to redirect it from your eyes now to your ma mouth. Lord, give her an insane intercessory prayer life. In the name of Jesus, just lift your hands and worship him. Lift your hands and worship him. Lift your hands and worship Him. Ooh. Can we take a second? Can we just take a second? Come on, let's, let's pray. Pray. We're not done warring now. We're not done warring. We're not done praying. I've got a word for the gathering in just a second. No, there's something special, something special. Don't you ever go anywhere, God says. Not anytime soon. For I've placed you at this place, at this time, for this season. The enemy would like to take you and to remove you because you're about to discover a greater anointing and a greater calling. But commit to me this night, says God, that you will wait on me and I will renew your strength and you will mount up with wings like eagles and you will run and you will not be weary. In fact, the weariness leaves you 
tonight in the name of Jesus. No more weariness. We just pray for him. There's an anointing on him right now. There's an anointing on him right now. God, I need everybody. You foul spirit that's tried to stop the call of God on this young man's life, I command you to go from him now in the name of Jesus. I release a violent anointing on you. To break through every line of Satan's defense. <laughs> lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Hallelujah. Lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Receive, receive. Now, 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 now. Lift your hands and pray, 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 pray. Give me just the drums and the keys. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. This is really unusual. But the Spirit of God gave me a specific word and told me to sit down and write. Bring that down just a tad, bring it down just a tad. The Lord said to me, Bridget, would you stand with, with Pastor? Would you stand with Pastor, if you can, for a moment? Oh, my mama said this, I can He said, I have seen this pastor's heart. I have redeemed this pastor's heart. And now I will replicate this pastor's heart in the congregation. What was once resident only in key leaders will soon become dominant in the culture for you are being armed for battle in this season. I have heard your prayers and I am about to give you a new voice. I have heard your prayers and I am about to give you a new voice as a sign to you when this begins to come to pass 
I will bring spiritual prodigals back home. When you see this happen, know that I am accelerating my work in you and through you. God is about to take the gathering from a ministry to becoming an end time ministry. He is going to drop a sense of urgency upon the remnant in the congregation for its end time mission. Do not be discouraged by the pruning that is about to take place, for I am increasing your fruitfulness. He said, tell them to prepare themselves, for if they will remain faithful, I am going to give them the key to the city, and whatever they bind will be bound, and whatever they loose will be loosed. Would you lift your hands and receive the key to the city? There's not more than one of them. God said, I'm giving the gathering the key to the city. Come on, lift your hands and receive it. I've given you the key. Now I'm going to give you the kingdom people to bring it to pass. My, 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 my. You're one of the ones God is raising up in this house. Come here. Do you go to the gathering? Oh, praise God. <laughs> praise God. The culture he just spoke about that was is on the pastor that's about to get in the congregation, he said, you're one of the main ones that God is going to use to bring this culture, to bring this, to bring this. Your pastor will never feel alone because of people like you. Lift your hands right now. I'm going to pray for a fresh endowment of power on you now in the name of Jesus. Don't patty cake. I want you, you ought to take 30 seconds, lose your mind. You ought to take 30 seconds, just praise him. Come on, that's two seconds. I said 30 seconds to lose your mind and praise him. I dare you to walk around and praise him. I dare you to clap. I dare you to jump. You got 15 more seconds. Come on. Give me some more warriors down here. Give me some more warriors down here. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Give me some more warriors down here praying. Give me some more. We're going to take just two more minutes. Come on. Give me some prayer warriors down here. Cram in here. People who know how to pray, cram in here for a minute. Something's shifting in the gathering this week. This week. This week, something's shifting in the gathering this week. This week. This week. This week. Shifting. Shifting. Shift it. Shift it in the name of Jesus. Give her an anointing that shifts things in the atmosphere. That shifts things in the ah, that shifts things in the atmosphere. Come on, come on, come on. Give me, you came down here to pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, raise them up. Raise them up. Raise them up. Raise up armor bearers. They can not only wear their own armor, they can carry the leadership's armor too. Give us some armor bearers who are so endued with power they can carry more than one set of armor. Give us armor bearers. 
Hallelujah. Did you receive? Did you receive? Hallelujah. Come here. Come here. Lift your hands. God's not done with you. He's going to give you a double portion. Double! No, 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 no. Oh, my, my. Double, 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 double. Double. Raise up an army. The gathering. God is marshalling his forces. God is gathering his troops for a divine invasion on society. What's happening right now is what took place before D-Day, where the enemy couldn't even see what was happening, but troops were being marshaled and gathered. That's what's happening. That's what this ministry is about. I'm telling you, this is no longer a ministry. This is an end-time ministry. And it's not because I said so. It became that on Sunday night. It became an end-time ministry. Something shift. Something shifted. Glory, glory, glory. You worship him. You worship him. You worship him. Your way, but in a way the devil can hear it. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him in your heavenly language if you got one. Worship him. Yeah. Ah. We were looking up the gathering today online trying to figure out how to give. I'm not real tech savvy, so I brought a check. And as I was looking it up, you know what came up? It came up in the search. It auto-filled the gathering Moravian Falls. <laughs> the Moravians. They brought the camps together. They sold themselves into slavery to preach the gospel. <laughs> come here, come here, come here, come here. You, come here, yeah, come here. God said when I was talking to them about the sacrifice on the altar, that was a word for you too. For I has not seen no one knows what you have laid on the altar. And God says, during this encounter week, that sacrifice has risen before me. It has reminded me of my promise. And now I'm going to. God doesn't just talk to people, talks through them. If you've ever laid a sacrifice on the altar, I dare you lift your hands and just tell the Lord, I receive. I receive. I receive. Now's the time to partner with the gathering. Now's the time. If you've been a casual attender, now's the time to be there every service, every time the doors are open. Nothing is more important. Now, now the key to your heart ought to be the vision statement of your church. If someone wants to get your attention, if they want to talk to you, you're bored unless you're talking about the vision of your church. Now is the time to engage, to let it become your life's blood. I'm not talking about something cultic. I'm talking about the vision of this church is the Word of God. It is the Great Commission. I'm talking about you partnering with the mission. This is the time. This is the moment. This is the season. And God is raising up an end-time ministry, and He is going to give you the key. 
to the city. Now, Father, we lift our hearts to you tonight. There's so much more that we could do here. But he's there with you to heal, to deliver, to set free. Just receive whatever you need. Whatever you need. And remember tonight. In fact, lift your hands and say this. Say this. Tonight, I receive a fighting spirit. I will not casually expect God to drop it on me in my recliner. I recognize I've been called to war and I will be on the front lines in the name of Jesus. Will you thank him for depositing that in you?